So in this chapter, we're really going to dig down to the weeds, talking about optimizing and debugging Spark. This is where things really, really get interesting. We'll do a quick review of our DAG or directed acyclic graph. We'll talk especially about narrow versus wide dependencies, huge, huge performance impacts that we talk about here. We'll talk about shuffling, what that is, talk about how to avoid it. We'll specifically look at these coalesce and repartition methods that we have available to us, some debug operators. We'll talk about serialization, and then we'll wrap up with a quick discussion of the debug web UIs that we have available to us. So let's do a quick review and look at a DAG from another angle. So when I do something like this, as we did in our word count example in previous videos, where I do a map and then a filter and then a reduce by key on a file that I read in with the text file command, that is going to implicitly create sort of directed acyclic graph or a set of hierarchies of RDDs. So the text file operation is going to result in what we call a Hadoop RDD, where we read a file from HDFS. This is automatically created for us. The map operator is going to create a mapped RDD. Of course, the filter operator then is going to create a filtered RDD. And then our reduce by key operator, if you remember that by key parameter at the end of a method call is going to do a shuffle. And in this case, we're going to end up with a shuffled RDD. The map is going to depend on the text file. The filter will depend on the map. And then the reduce by key will depend on the filter. And then obviously, when we're talking about a file that we read in from HDFS, in this case, let's say that file was three blocks in size. By default, it would read in three partitions. These orange blocks we're talking about here, we're sort of breaking convention. This is not an individual server. We're talking about the entire flow of our data. So that part one, two, and three would probably each exist on an independent individual slave. We're just talking about representing them as the entire contents of the file. With the map operator, we're going to be able to operate on those parts directly as they are without changing them or without moving them. Very key concept there. Filter is going to work on the exact same parts, but then this is where things get tricky when we want to do our reduce. We're probably not going to be doing a reduce on the exact same parts. In this case, maybe imagine that we're doing some sort of sales tallying on our regions of the world. And maybe let's say we've got a presence in Asian Pacific region and a presence in North America. So we would want to reduce by those two keys, the Asian sales and the US sales. So we're not talking about blocks of a file. We're talking about how we, the developer, want to aggregate our data. In this case, we would end up with two parts. That isn't to say that part three went away. These are completely different parts that we're talking about when we do this. We're just using that part convention there as well. Let's look at it from another angle and talk about actual physical optimizations, where the data lives when we process it. And a really important concept and a really important word here is something called pipelining. Some of the transformations that we do can be pipelined, which really means they can all be performed in parallel in a single, what we're referring to as a stage of execution. And what we're talking about, the in parallel part, that means obviously because each of those parts are on a different slave, all the map operations would happen in parallel. But as soon as they happen, because the parts have not changed at all, we could then, if you remember, the next step was a filter operation. We could do the filter in place on the same data without moving it anywhere. That part one, two, and three can actually be each one, each part can be processed in memory if our data can be pipelined. Previous cached RDDs can be truncated, which means ejected or not used in memory. That's the default behavior. We don't really store a RDD in memory for longer than we need it. Really important concept here is dependencies can be something that we call narrow, meaning that the RDD operation can occur in place without moving the data, or dependency can be what we call wide. And this, in contrast, means the data is going to move across the network. This is what we call a shuffle operation. So let's actually look at this via a drawing itself. And again, if we go back to what we drew before with our text file map filter reduced by key operations, remember that part one and two in our reduced by key is a completely different key. We're not talking about the same part one and part two. We're talking about our reduced key operator. So the subsequent map and filters, they depend directly on the previous part's data. The part itself or the block of data that came in from HDFS doesn't need to go anywhere. We can run a map on it. And then in memory on the same slave node for part one, let's say, we can run a filter operation. These create dependencies that are directly related to a previous part. But then things get tricky 
when we talk about the reduce, again, by key operator, we know that's going to kick off a shuffle. And in this case, because let's say all of our Asian sales might be in any of the previous blocks. So the part one, let's say that's the processor for our Asia data, it's going to have to reach out to all the subsequent executors the exact same way that MapReduce, the reducers, will reach out to all the previous mappers, and it's going to say, hey, give me your results. So I can sort through them and look for all the Asian data. And then the part two in our reduce key by operation is going to have to do the same thing. Let's say we also were looking for sales in Africa or Europe or other presences that we had, we would then have additional reduce by keys for those as well. These two dependencies from our map to our text file and from our filter to our map, this is what we call narrow. Each part depends directly on the previous part. But then when we do a shuffle operation, this is what we call a wide dependency, and that's going to move data across the network. This has impacts on what we call stages inside of Spark. And anything we can do in a series of pipelined or a series of narrow operators by doing the operation directly on the data in memory without moving it anywhere, we call this an individual stage. And then we have to move the data across. That's going to kick off another stage. And then if we, for example, did a filter operation on that reduced by key, again, that would be a narrow dependency in that stage two. So we would still only have two stages. Very, very important concept, whether dependency is narrow or wide, we want to do as much as possible in a narrow fashion and do our wide dependencies as little as possible. So now let's zoom out a little bit and talk about some terminology and some physical execution units. So the same way in MapReduce that a job is all of the code and all of the input data that we need to run that code against, means the same thing here. It's all the code and all of the RDD executions, all the transformations, all the actions required to do a full analysis on a set of data. A stage, again, is all of the tasks running a single set or wave of pipeline or ability to operate on the data in place sort of work. That begs the question, what is a task? A single unit of work on a single RDD partition. So again, back to that part one, two, and three, for example, a map task would be the map code that runs on just part one or just part two on slave one versus slave two, typically. So a single task is a single unit of work corresponding to a single RDD partition. Again, MapReduce uses the same terminology there. Shuffle, same terminology from MapReduce, transfer of data between stages for grouping, ordering, aggregate operations, basically all the same sorts of things we would do in a type of MapReduce operations. Any of those by key operations, any of the coalesce or repartitions that we'll talk about shortly, all of those are going to result in a shuffle. So hopefully this slide that we've had in a previous video is going to make a whole lot more sense. We know that shuffle is going to be Spark's mechanism for redistributing the data across our partitions, and that again, certain operations in Spark will trigger a shuffle. And these are the ones that you really, really need to be aware about. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to guess based on the transformation type that we're running, whether that creates a shuffle or not? We do have the ability to do that, and that is via this to debug string command. So we can see there are counts at the very top of that first line of code. We're just basically doing those operations. And then we can take counts and do a to debug string to it. And that's going to return to our console the following output that we see after that blank line with the res84. And we can see that we have a string that comes back. And this is the full DAG with all the intermediate RDDs listed. And if you look at the number in our parentheses there in front, you can see that we have two numbers. One of them is a simple flat shuffled RDD with no direct pipeline, previous pipeline dependencies on it. So that's why it has a two in front of it. We can see that that was caused by the reduce by key, whereas our next four lines, where we have the plus minus parentheses three, those next four lines, we can see that they're somehow grouped together. And then we can see that there's a filtered RDD, a mapped RDD, and then a Hadoop RDD that are generated via these various commands that we run. So when we look at this, the number in front of our operation, in front of our RDD, is going to indicate which uh, part of the DAG that it corresponds to. So that two that appears there in the shuffled RDD is really our stage two, whereas everything else that appears after that is, again, our stage one. We show the most recent at the top back to our oldest RDDs that are generated below. Very useful to run this two debug string and actually see the DAG operations that are coming back. 
So now let's talk about coalesce and repartition. We may have some situation like this where we can run this get num partitions method on our RDD. This works on any RDD, and that's going to return the number of tasks that will launch if we perform any transformation on that RDD. And in this case, let's say it's something like 43,000 partitions, right? Uh, that might be a little bit too much, depending on the size of your cluster. If you've got 43,000 cores in your cluster, that might not be a big deal. But let's say your cluster only has 10 cores, or let's say that the data itself, you know that each individual partition is only maybe a few K, and you're not going to get a very optimized, even in memory, startup read and then shutdown process if you're doing a bunch of small little operations on tiny little bits of partitions. So we can use this coalesce parameter or coalesce method on our RDD that we see there after the empty line. We're doing that coalesce there in bold, and then we're telling Spark that we want just 10 partitions. Now, coalesce is going to kick off a repartition. It's going to kick off a shuffle operation, and it's going to move data across the network. Those 43,000 individual partitions are now going to be moved down to just 10. So that's why we would want to cache this operation at the very end. Now, when we do a get num partitions, we end up with 10, and then maybe that job runs a whole lot faster because in each partition, maybe we've got something like a few hundred megabytes of data and we can process through it much quicker. So in contrast, repartition does the opposite. So if we find that we're running some sort of operation and then through previous transformations that we've done, previous especially by key or any sort of shuffle operation, we ended up with a fewer number of partitions. In this case, when we do our get num partitions, we only get 10 back, which we know on subsequent transformations is going to result in 10 individual tasks running on slave nodes. But when you look at your cluster and you know maybe this is the only job running in there, you realize, hey, I've got 5,000 cores in this cluster. I've got a whole bunch of cores that are basically doing nothing. And then maybe each partition, even if it is a few hundred megabytes or a few gigs in size, maybe it's still running a little bit slow. Instead, you can do the opposite and take your number of partitions and break it up into a higher number via this repartition method. We pass in the number of partitions we'd like. Again, we're going to cache that in memory because that's an expensive operation. At that point, when we do our get number of partitions and our count, it matches the number of cores, and we might see, in this case, things speed up faster because our core count, we're engaging all the cores in our cluster. This will perform a shuffle. Both the repartition and the coalesce are going to perform a shuffle, and that's why we'd want to cache this data. So another very important optimization mechanism is serialization. And our big recommendation here is to use Cryo, the Cryo serializer. The Java-based serializer is just a sort of okay kind of system. This is why Doug Cutting sort of rewrote it when he was building base core Hadoop. And he went on then to write something called Avro, which is a more robust serialization mechanism. Cryo is something that was written and we found it has a much better impact inside of Spark. So it's a much faster serializer than Avro. And setting it up is very, very simple. It's literally just this code here calling a set method in bold there on our Spark conf object, setting the Spark serializer parameter to, again, the cryo serializer class, which, depending on the version of Spark that you're using, might be there already, or you might have to load it individually. But you're going to find when you do that, you might start getting things like out of memory errors, garbage collector overflows, other issues because as you're taking this rich object and converting it down to something that you can transmit across the wire or something that you can write persistently to disk or to memory, you're overrunning the size of the buffer that Cryo is using. That's what either of these errors really means. So what you can do is typically you're going to set that up to a larger size if you get either one of these. And again, we can just call that set method on our Spark Conf object and change this time we're going to pull up the cryo serializer and then call a chained set on that, setting its buffer size in megabytes to say 32. And you can keep experimenting with that for performance, baselining, changing it to another parameter, rerunning, seeing if you get better performance or not. Using logging and especially the web GUIs that ship with Spark when we start up a single Spark context, that's going to launch a web UI. And if we have multiple of them running, it's going to bind to higher ports. So the default one that we start with is 4040. If you're running like three Spark context jobs simultaneously, the second one might get 4041 and the third one might get 4042. 
We know that it'd be really nice, for example, to tell when a certain stage or a certain operation, a certain transformation is running slower than others. The way that we can do that is through this web UI that we have. Our Spark Context web UI is going to show us our scheduler stages and tasks along with the time that it took to complete each individual transformation itself. It's going to show RDD sizes, memory usage, in case we think we might be running out of memory or memory buffers, environmental information like environment variables, running executor information, how many tasks are complete and so forth. And then Yarn as well, you're probably aware it has something called a history server, which gives us details about each job that ran in a Yarn cluster, of which Spark might be one. This is not started by default, but again, very, very simple to start up via this command that you have there. A whole lot more information about monitoring and about logging and so forth. This URL should work in perpetuity, even on subsequent versions of Spark. So this is a quick look at the web UI that we have there. We can see not only the stages, we can also see, if you look over there, four columns in on our active and completed stages, we see the duration. So we might be able to tell that a certain shuffle operation or a certain transformation, for example, is taking a whole lot longer than other peers that it has in that set of transformations. And again, the last two columns there, we can see our shuffle read and write. So when a shuffle occurred, we can see how much data was transferred around. There's a whole lot more information about the web UIs. We'll look at it a little bit in the subsequent lab that we have here. But again, I highly recommend learning more about the web UIs and exploring them in more detail. Same thing can be said about the detailed tuning. The things we've shown you here, the serialization, the stages, repartition, shuffling, all that sort of stuff is going to be your biggest bang for your buck. This is where you're going to get the highest returns on efficiencies and so forth. But again, this rabbit hole goes very deep, deeper than we have to explore in this class. Highly recommend checking out the additional information maintained at the excellent documentation that we have in Spark. Some of the best practices to just repeat, obviously try to filter early. The less data passing through the system, especially when we do a shuffle, the faster things are gonna run. Obviously trying to compress your stages, have the minimal number of stages, considering doing pipelining and so forth. Obviously along with that goes avoiding shuffle operations. After an expensive operation like a shuffle, you may want to cache results especially if you're going to be doing machine learning or some type of iterative processing. Broadcast variables, again, we talked about this in previous slides. You might want to consider using those to cache sort of side lookup data on all of the slaves that you're going to be running. Try to maximize your data locality. Try to maximize your number of available cores. Try to get a few hundred megabytes, at least dozens of megabytes per individual partition. And then obviously serializing larger data set, I would say really anything over even just a few hundreds of megabytes in size, which is probably going to be almost all your data is going to benefit from doing serialization. And then obviously making sure that you're aware of and understand the capabilities and the information you have available to you in the web GUIs. Lots more to learn, but hopefully we've at least showed you the large picture optimization and tuning parameters that you can use to make your jobs run a whole lot faster. Hey, thanks a bunch for watching this O'Reilly training video. If you need more information on this topic, please click on learn more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the O'Reilly video training YouTube channel for more tutorials and be sure to like us on Facebook.